Wouldn't so. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and fill this place and take my lips and speak through them. Take our ears and hear through them. Take our eyes and see through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our wills, bend them to your own, and take our hearts, set them more and more on fire with love for you, Lord Christ. For it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. 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 Please be seated. You know, uh, I thought about uh, uh, doing some of this uh, that I'm going to start with this morning uh, occasionally, and I've been encouraged uh, to do it, uh, do it more. Uh, or start to do it, period, and that is to maybe give you just a little, uh, maybe not every Sunday, but a liturgical moment. Um, uh, that's what I call it, just about explain or remind people why we do certain things in the course of a Eucharist service, and just so that we might be reminded of them, or if we happen not to be aware of them, we'll become aware of them. Uh, I'll just start with uh, today is you know, about why we process in. And why is it that a, a cross leads the way uh, for us? You know, if you think of the way that the church is, is set up, first off, it's in the it's generally most often speaking in, in the sign of a cross. I don't know if you notice that, the main aisle at the front and two out this way, a little bit forward, but uh, are, are sometimes called an altar, sometimes called a holy table. Right here, that represents God's presence. But we process, rather than just kind of wander in, uh, like some traditions do, we process because that makes it us at least a little bit aware that something special is happening. Uh, the Psalms have a section, Psalm 120 through 134, that are all called Psalms of Ascents. And tradition tells us that when the Israelites made their pilgrimages uh, to Jerusalem to go to the temple for their uh, annual or maybe even sometimes more often than annual requirements, they would, uh, they would sing these psalms as they approached, the, went up to, to Jerusalem, up to the temple. And so it helps us to be aware that something special is happening. But also the cross leads the way because if the holy table or the altar represents God's presence here in our midst, the only way we're really allowed to approach God is through the work of the cross. And so, in a sense, Jesus' work on the cross leads the way right up to the altar, and we follow. Um, there'll be other things in other weeks. I don't know if that's helpful to you, if that's uh, maybe from your catechism class or, or confirmation preparation, if that uh, rings a bell or not. Uh, but just little, little things uh, that we do symbolically that maybe help our, our worship a little bit. Um, we're coming to the end of a liturgical season. Uh, next week will be the last Sunday in the liturgical season. The following Sunday we'll be uh, starting the new one with the uh, first Sunday of Advent. And so we come to some passages that are, um, well, so somewhat maybe a little bit hard for us to hear and to contemplate and to ponder and things like that. That passage from the Old Testament from Malachi um, made us remember there's really kind of two options for us to face in eternity. Uh, with God or without God, in, in a sense. And actually, when Margaret and I did our devotions earlier this morning, uh, we, do a, we do a few things. You know, all, all of you know, we do a devotional called The Encounter with God. Um, but we also do one, that, that, a booklet that was given to us at our, at our wedding uh, a year and a half ago called Mr. and Mrs., Devotions for, for Married Couples. Uh, but then Margaret also pulled up on her phone the app on the app, the, one of the morning prayer apps, and it seemed like everything had the same sort of theme. Uh, and that is that we're going to go through some rough times. We're going to go through some rough times, but we need to remember. We need to remember the things that God has said to us, how God has provided for us, and in a sense hide those things in our, in our heart. Um, let me read you just a portion of that encounter with God uh, that we had this morning. This is based on Psalm 27. You can go read Psalm 27. It's not real long. It's only 14 verses uh, later on uh, this afternoon. But it says, when the world seems to be crashing down around us, 
In what or in whom do we trust? David, the psalmist and leader, is battle ready. He resolutely puts his faith in God, thus encouraging others to follow his example. This psalm expresses David's utmost confidence in God, leading him to prayer and praise. In spite of the threats to his life and well-being, and this was a phrase that kind of resonated with us this morning, David rehearses what he knows about God. How often do we rehearse what we know about God? Especially when we're going through tough times. The Lord himself is a place of safety. David doesn't look to his own resources. Pause for a moment. David doesn't look to his own resources. When you think about the gospel reading today, coming out and, and the apostles, the disciples were saying, Jesus, do you see this incredible temple here? And he says, the day's coming when that's going to be thrown down. It's going to be destroyed. And in essence, he was saying, don't put your trust in the temple. In a sense, he was saying, don't put your trust into what you do. Into what you do. Put your trust into what God does. Put your trust into what God has done. Put your trust into what God has promised he will do. And that's why that shout to the Lord song that we just sang was, was perfect uh, for that. Thank you. <laughs> you like that song? Yeah, I mean, we, like, we tend to like that song, I think. Shout to the Lord. That's a, that was a great song. You know, David doesn't look to his own resources. Instead, his words describe a man who knows God and has experienced him as a refuge from trouble. In the face of ominous circumstances, his heart, which indicates his whole essential self, is focused on God. Who needs to be afraid when God is on your side? The prayer expresses David's continuing longing for God and his trust in him. Maybe this is the day of trouble. If so, David knows that he is safe in God's hand. His meditation and resulting assurance from God lead him to a renewed offering of himself to the Lord, to prayer, and to praise. Just offer that to you. Think about that psalm also ended with, uh, what was the whole, whole kind of theme about uh, God's going to make everything right. Old Testament did that, Malachi. God's going to make everything right in his good time and in his ways. And those who love him will be established in peace. And those who don't love him, well, they're going to end up in a situation that they would wish they weren't forever. Incredible stuff when you think about it. Lots of toil and pain. The epistle, uh, kind of Paul getting into a very practical section in this letter to the Thessalonians about those who don't work, don't eat. That's pretty bleak. I mean, how much of us would just like to sit on our laurels and have everything given to us? But God said, Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, no, don't eat. Don't have anything to do with them. If they're capable of working and they choose not to, in a sense, don't have anything to do with them. Pull away from them. That's, that's belief. So, you know, if somebody comes to us seeking help and we know for a fact that they're contributing to their own problem and they can't do anything about it, yes, there's going to be people that are mentally ill or have fallen on hard times that we need to give help to. But if there's nothing wrong with them and they're just basically stealing from society, stealing from, in a sense, the body of Christ, because that's who Paul is addressing, the, Thessal the, the Christians in Thessalonica, stealing, in a sense, from the church. He says, no, don't give it to them. Don't help them. Let them learn to work. He goes on from there, and, and he says, well, he, he says, well, he says it in a command. He says, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who's walking in idleness, and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. You know, that word tradition um, means the fullness of that which has been passed on. The word def means passing on. Okay, so passing on, not just things that we do, like say maybe in the traditions of the church, but the whole body of the law, the whole body of doctrine, of right belief and right action. It really encompasses all of that. Uh, and so it's not just just tradition, but the tradition should be a means 
by which we are again reminded of it, uh, maybe encouraged uh, in it all, and, and those, those sorts, sorts of things. Not just things that we do because it floats our boat, but because God has called us to it. It does help us with respect to eternity and those sorts of things, uh, and, and is a means for God to bless us. And then that gospel uh, reading today, uh, again, back to the, the reading about the destruction of the temple. Did you hear the way it ended? It says, by your endurance, you will gain your lives. The New International Version translates that phrase, by standing firm, you will gain your life. Think about that. By standing firm, by pressing through the problems, why would he need to tell them that they need to stand firm? Because he knows that there's going to be persecutions coming. Indeed, that's what the, what uh, Paul hit on in the Thessalonians back in the early chapter, for chapter 1, talks about their persecutions. Do you realize that the, the, the probability is high as you look around things happening in the world, and especially, yes, I'll include America, the possibility, the probability is ever increasing that you and I, people who call ourselves Christians, are going to be persecuted. You know, that's the way it was in the early days of the church. Some theologians say, well, it's going to come full circle. It's going to come back to where the early church, as the early church was persecuted, so the late church is going to be persecuted. So how do we hold on? How do we maintain? And that's where I'm going to come right back to that collect prayer that we had. It's Scripture Sunday. We have it every Sun, every year at this time. How did it read? Let me read it again. O oh Lord, blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, Grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Ever hold fast. You know, we hear that oftentimes, not just in the scriptures, but we hear it in the liturgy. We need to hold fast. And how do we do that? But by, we need to spend time in the scriptures. I want to ask you to evaluate something here at the end of a liturgical season. How much time do you give to reading your Bible? Okay? How much time do you give? Would you say that you read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest it? You know, we've had in recent, uh, uh, recent readings where Paul brings out some, some e examples or some uh, comparisons. Uh, he had recently where about an athlete who uh, competes according to the rules will gain the prize. You know, again, back to something Margaret and I did yesterday, had, some, had lunch with some friends, longtime friends of Margaret's who are in the prison ministry. By the way, you can pray for Dan and Shirley. Dan is in one of the highest security prisons in the country. You ever heard of this guy named El Chapo? Yeah. He's in that prison. <laughs> and nobody ever gets to see him. He is in solitary along with a bunch of others. But that's where Dan goes to minister to these, these guys. Uh, anyway, we were talking with them yesterday uh, about, you know, church stuff and faith and all that kind of stuff. And they brought up the uh, thing about golfing. Any of you golf? Nobody? Oh, I see one hand go up. Okay, well this may not be a, an apt <laughs> example, I don't know. I don't golf, I tried golfing a long, 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 long time ago and I was, it was, I was way, way too frustrating for me, that's for sure. Amen. But Dan, Dan used the example. <laughs> Talking about a, a friend of theirs that they both know, that it's a professional, I think, if I remember, I can't remember his name, it doesn't matter. Glenn. Glenn. Ben. And how wonderful he is. I mean, he's, he could, he said, I'm going to hit this ball, and it's going to go right over here, and it's going to go this way to get there. And he hits it, and it does it. And I'm going to hit this ball, and it's going to go over here, and it's going to go this way to get there. And he does it. And one time after another, he said, but, but the point they made was, do you know how many golf balls he hits every day, virtually every day? Hundreds. 
Hundreds. Now here's my question for us. If somebody that's a professional does that kind of practice before he gets into actual competition, how much do you think we need to do in practice before we're actually hit with competition of needing to stand firm? Hours and hours and hours before it's, we're actually put to the test. You can take that analogy and you can put it to the farmer. How, how much does the farmer? Audrey. Many, many years ago, John used to practice every yeah. day. Yeah. 300 golf balls a day. A day. And you know who picked them up. I noticed that John's not here this morning. <laughs> oh, good, good. There you go. Well, there you go. I mean, if you want to be good at something, you have to, you have to tackle it. Amen. You have to pay attention. You have to, again, read, mark, learn, inwardly digest it. And every one of us is called to do that with the Word of God. Otherwise, David is, was, is not going to stand when the trial comes. You're not going to stand when the trial comes, except by the grace of God if he were just to supernaturally come upon you and say, yeah, don't worry about it, Andy. Don't worry. Put your name in the, in the blank. Don't worry about it. I got this. I got this. The farmer, he studies everything about the weather. When the frost is coming, what's the expectation for, for uh, you know, rain? All those things. Uh, when he needs to bring it in. The analogies are endless. The professional salesperson knows how to, basically, how to manipulate you to buy what he or she is selling. To a certain degree, manipulation. You might actually need it, but, but a lot of times you don't. Anybody care to give a testimony to something they bought? They didn't need? But the idea, they, they commit their lives to it. We are called to commit our lives to knowing the scripture. Read, mark, learn, inwardly digest, and stand fast. Is that what is that the one? Yeah, and hold fast was the phrase in there. I came across an example uh, a few weeks ago about an example of somebody holding fast. This was a fella back in the 1980s, uh, and he, he and his uh, co-pilot were flying a Beechcraft 99. Jim, I know you used to be a pilot. Any other pilots uh, in our midst or former pilots? Anyway, Beechcraft 99 is 15 passenger propeller plane, and uh, they're flying and they hear something, I don't know, just sort of a, a noise that wasn't right. The pilot goes back and says, you take over to the, to the co-pilot, the pilot goes back to the, to the passenger area and finds that the, the door, uh, and, and it's a door that opened to the side of the plane, back towards the back of the plane, uh, wasn't all the way closed. Something happened, it had come ajar. And right there as he gets to the door, the plane hits some turbulence, whew, whatever. He falls against the door. The door opens. Uh -oh. The door opens and he falls out with the door. The door, you know, hangs out like this. And, of course, the co-pilot uh, knows that uh, uh, the door's open. I guess there's some, something in the cockpit that says the door's open. You better do something. He thinks that his pilot has fallen out. The pilot it grabs for anything he can hold on to, anything at all. And the co-pilot lands as fast as he can. And when they, when they get, uh, when they land, they find that the pilot has hung on. And he is so tight that they literally had to pry his hands off whatever it was he was holding onto, and his head was six inches from the pavement. It was six inches. Hold fast to the Word of God. Hold fast. When you're being challenged, when you're being tried, that's what you need to go back to and know. But you've got to know it. You've got to put it in you in order to know it and hold on to it when you need it. It's a good word. So I want to encourage you and think about how much time do you spend and how much are you committing to memory? You don't have to know the reference. If you happen to know where it is, you know, 1 Corinthians 2, 13, whatever, that's okay. But I know God said, you know, he's going to get me through this. 
I know Psalm 27 was by David. I'm going to go back and read it again. How much do you hide into your heart? Because when we go out there, we're not only going to be persecuted, but we're going to be challenged. And we're going to start asking, wondering about it in our own mind, is, is that right? Or is what I've written? No, I know. I know who I have known because I've known the scripture and I know it's inspired and I know that he's good to his word. So as we come to the end of, end of you know, our, our time in the liturgical season, maybe think about, is there an adjustment that's needed for you in read, to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest? Make, that, that word digest means make it a part of our, the fullness of our system of what we are, who we are. Or am I just kind of, eh, you know, I'll get around to it when I get around to it. I'm going to pray, but before we move on to our Nicene Creed, we have another special for you this morning, and that is, uh, well, Jim, come on up. Uh, I've asked Jim to, to share a little bit about how, how well he, he, he's offered this, and the fact is the offer goes to anybody. If you have something that you think would be a benefic benefit to us to hear about how God has worked in your life, just as we've heard recently from Bob and John before that, then let me know. Let me know, and we'll get that scheduled. And so Jim said, Jim's been through some experiences, so I want to pray, but then I want to pray for you and let you share, okay? He said, he, he said it'll only take a few minutes, but that's okay. You share what the Holy Spirit puts on your heart, okay? okay? Father God, we do thank you for your word. You have revealed yourself to us in so many ways, but the primary way is through your word. So we do, I do pray for each and every one of us that we would read Mark, learn, inwardly digest your word, that when persecution comes, not if, but when, we would hold fast. Hold fast like that pilot held on to the, uh, to whatever it was he held on to to keep him from falling out. And we would hold fast to you, to your word, and that you would be glorified. And now come Holy Spirit and bless your servant Jim and bless us as he shares. Uh, may we have ears to hear uh, what he has to share uh, for your glory, Lord Christ. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 You want to stand here or you want to go over there? Where do you want to go? Oh, well, in here. In here. I guess everybody can hear me all right. Can you? Yeah. Uh, well, it was a cool and cloudy day in Winter Haven. Oh, no, that's not right. <laughs> uh, uh, you, are, you already took some of my thunder when you asked if there were any pilots. Oh. Because I was going to, that was what I was going to say. Well, go for it. Are there any pilots in here? <laughs> and, uh, I mean, well, of course, you know, there, you know, there are uh, military pilots and general aviation pilots. Mm. That's an entirely different breed. Because the military pilots have a lot more um, at their disposal as far as uh, flying an airplane than the general aviation pilots. I come from the breed of, that you might call a, a seat of the pants. Uh, uh, I, sh I, I was actually born a little too late because I should have been uh, flying airplanes in the First World War. That, that's about, uh, about my, what my feeling is about flying. However, uh, I wasn't so. But just to give you an idea about how long ago it was that I started flying, well, I not only had hair, but my, my cost of taking pilot's lessons was $10 for the airplane and $5 for the, for the instructor. Mm, wow. uh, you, can, you can imagine how long that, that would go that long. But anyway, uh, long later on, as uh, I was about 40 years old when, uh, when I've, I've came to the realization that uh, that it wasn't about me, it was about God. <laughs> but uh, at that time I decided, I decided that I wanted to be a missionary pilot. So I went to work uh, getting my, uh, my ratings. I am, as, as I stand here, I am a, a commercial pilot land and sea, multi and single, instrument, uh, instructor, basic instructor. 
Uh, you can see it, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And also, in order to be a missionary pilot, I decided that I needed to be a mechanic. Mm -hmm. So I went to Atlanta Technical School for two years to become uh, an A&P an, uh, pilot, a uh, mechanic, rather. And I actually did, uh, although it wasn't the Lord's uh, will for me to be a missionary pilot the way I thought I was going to be, but uh, I did actually work for one year with Wycliffe at, uh, at a little uh, town in North Carolina called Waxhaw, which is their, their, uh, their mechanical and, and radio uh, facility there. And we, you know, we did, we, we got, uh, it was so long ago that the government was even giving us uh, surplus airplanes. You know, we had some, had some, heli uh, some helicopters. And I was working on a DC, or a, 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 what was a C-47. Uh, we, were, we were refurbishing it to use in, in, uh, in, uh, in our missionary work in, uh, in, in uh, South America. Well, I did, that for, I did that for about a year, and, and then uh, the Lord turned me in a, in a different direction. <laughs> but I, I wanted to share with you a, a couple. The reason I don't get up and talk more is because I tend to ramble. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and as, I've heard, as I've heard, and I'm sure it's true, that there's, there's nothing as boring as an old man reminiscing about the good old days. <laughs> so I'll, I just wanted to share just a couple of instances where the Lord uh, saved my bacon mm. as I was flying. I mean, th this, this is just a couple of instances because I don't want to be up here the rest of the day. And, but time after time after time, even before I realized who he was, he took care of me. Mm -hmm. Well, in one instance, uh, well now, to, to, uh, as an instrument pilot, there, there are two different kinds of, of approaches to an airport under the, that's in, a, in the cloud, you know, under, under the building. <laughs> And one is called a non-precision non approach. And one is called a precision approach. Well, with a precision approach, the instruments on the ground will bring you right down to the end of the runway without you, well, you have to have about maybe 100 feet of, of visibility. But with a non-precision approach, you have to have more visibility. The clouds have to be higher than they are otherwise. So one one time when I was, uh, I like I used to like to fly at night because you might not think it, but you can see better at night hmm. than you can in the daytime. Hmm. With one possible problem there, if you, if you get into an area where there's a, a lot of a lot of lights everywhere, hmm. and you're trying to find a, a kind of a, a small airport that are supposed to have landing lights like this, you know, mm -hmm. and some of the lights are out, mm -hmm. and you can't tell which is the lights from, well, anyway, you get the idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, but one of the, one of the uh, places I used to go was the DeKalb Peachtree Airport in Atlanta. Now, the DeKalb Peachtree Airport is, in the, is, is right in the, I mean, that's the Atlanta metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of tall buildings. And what made me think about this was I read a, an article a couple of weeks ago in the paper <clears throat> about someone who was trying to make an approach there that, that crashed into a, a, an apartment building. Mm. Luckily, nobody was killed in the apartment building, but of course the people in the airplane perished. Mm. But that, that made me think about this particular incident. One, one night about well, three o'clock in the morning, I was trying to make an, a, a non-precision approach to that airport, and, um, and this is a really non-precision precision. <laughs> you have to you have to go across a. They got these places they call uh, omni omnidirectional um, sites. You know where where they where it puts out radio uh, radials all the way around the, the, the clock around the compass. And what you do, you go, you go, and you, you get to this place. And at that particular airport, you have to go 
in a, in a direction of the airport and, and go further than the, than the, uh, than the, air, the, uh, the runways and make a left, make a turn and come back around heading in the direction of the, of the, of the runway in the opposite direction. In this, in this case, the, uh, the runway that you come back around to is run, runway 9. Well, you have to go across runway 27 and, and come back around. Well, this this is this is kind of tricky because you've got to keep your your your, uh, your timing, your your, uh, your your direction, and your height at just just you know right right on all the time, or else you're going to have some problems. Well, at this particular night, I was flying a, a Mooney, I think. But that, that's a nice little airplane, incidentally. But anyway, um, I, I came across and I started to make my my approach, and it, it was a bad night. It was you know it was foggy and and uh, wasn't hardly any visibility at all. <coughs> all of a sudden, as I was as I was starting to make that that uh, turn, you know, I was, I was going to go across and then come back around like this to come in on runway nine, which was the active runway. But at three o'clock in the morning, it didn't make any difference. But just as I was as I was going across, I looked down, and by golly, there was the end of runway two seven. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a hole through that cloud, just like, you know, there, there was some reason. It was, and so of course, I just uh, I called the tower and said, "Hey, tower, I'm landing on two seven. <laughs> pull pull my flaps <laughs> right down. And landed on two seven, and everybody was happier because of it. I was happier, I guarantee you. And there was another, there was another plane sitting down at the other end of the runway, waiting to, to come up, come out and take the runway and take off. And he couldn't come out and get on the runway until I had finished my approach. So he was happy, I was happy, and anyway, that came out pretty well. The, the, only, the only other thing I want to talk about is. Uh, People that have uh, that use that fly airplanes, well, you, you've got uh, you, you've got complex airplanes, and uh, and those that are not, the ones that are not <coughs> complex have fixed gear and fixed props. The ones that are complex have retractable gear and and uh, 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 props that you can you can you can. Uh, what do they call it? Uh, well, anyway, you can very, the very, on it. Variable pitch? Change, variable pitch props, yeah, to, uh, depending on what, what you need it for. But anyway, I was flying, uh, <clears throat> after, after a while, uh, after I started get, getting more of my, I, I was, like I said, I was a commercial pilot. And I used to fly people from Greenville, South Carolina, where I was at the time, to little places I'd, I'd never go overnight because I was also running a business in, in Greenville, and uh, but uh, at this particular time, I was I had a, a customer that was going to Knoxville, Tennessee. Well, from Greenville, from Greenville, South Carolina to Knoxville, Tennessee, I mean it's it's zip, zip, nothing, you know nothing to it. But if you're going to drive, it's <laughs> around the mountains and so forth. But uh, with the airplane, you know, you just fly over the mountain. But there's one difficulty there. <laughs> there's always difficulty. The, the airport in Knoxville is in a bowl. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, and the, the fog just, in the, you know, in the morning, it just lays there on the airport. Well, there's a maximum when you're flying uh, complex airplanes. If you haven't <coughs> landed, Wheel, wheels up yet? You're going to. <laughs> well, this was this was how the Lord kept me from landing wheels up. In this instance, I had a customer. I was flying a a, a Beechcraft Bonanza, I think. But anyway, when I came around, and it, this is a, this is an also a non-position approach, but it's it's better than the other one because you start out from your Omni station and go right straight into the runway. You know, just and, there, and there's not a whole lot of uh, lot of uh, obstructions around. In this particular instance, um, I was uh, I was very intent. Of course, I, I couldn't see a thing. 
and I was getting lower and lower, and I knew I should be getting closer, and my timing showed me that I was getting closer at the airport, and I was getting lower and lower, and I, I, I finally, I saw, I looked out, and I saw just a few feet below me, grass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the grass is not what I wanted to see. <laughs> no, 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 yeah. So I shoved my power forward, reached for my, my, uh, wheat, my landing gear to put it back up, and my landing gear had not been, re had, was still up. Mm. I had not put my landing gear down. Now, if I had, if I had seen concrete when I, when I saw the ground, that, that would have been the time that I was, that I would have made that landing wheels up. Yeah. And I don't know whether you've ever seen what happens to an airplane when it plant, oh, yeah. the, <laughs> without wheels, when mm. it's, a, it's concrete. It isn't pretty. Yeah. No. And it, it's the worst, the, the best thing can happen, it just destroys the airplane, if, if, even if you come out all right. Well, anyway, I, I called, I called, uh, and I, I, I told them I was on the go, and they vectored me back around to start another, another, uh, another uh, attempt. Oh, so when I came back around, I made sure my wheels were down. <laughs> And uh, this time, when I got down to about five feet off the ground, I could see concrete. Mm. So I landed. But to give you an idea about how, how uh, foggy it was, after I landed, the, uh, the tower called me and said, are you on the ground? Oh, wow. <laughs> it, it, it really, you know, it really is foggy. But anyway, that, that was uh, that's a couple of the instances where where uh, where the Lord just uh, uh, saved my bacon, as as I said. <laughs> but anyway, I was going to uh, I was going to sing, but since uh, since the time's going the way it is, I won't. <laughs> <laughs>